Hey guys and welcome to the channel. If this is your first time here, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, hit that notification bell, that way when I post a new video you'll be one of the first to see it. Today we're going to be talking about issues that face the South Carolina public waterfowler. Now there are all kind of issues, uh, I've heard it all uh, but we're going to be talking about that. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a bill that is being introduced into uh, the state legislator legislation. Uh, we're going to be talking about that and going to give you my opinions on what needs to happen uh, in order to start getting ducks back into our public areas. So y'all stay tuned because we're fixing to kick it. Hey everybody, uh, Matt asked me to make this little video. He he wanted a bunch of people to kind of come together and collaborate a video on what we think the biggest problem is in South Carolina as to why we don't have ducks. And for me, in comparison with like the Midwest states and, and states in the other flyways and all, we just don't have the food they got. That's plain and simple. I mean, anybody that's been to Arkansas can see that. Arkansas plants rigorously every year for ducks. They don't always get them, but they got food for them when they get there, and that holds them there. Um, our state doesn't do anything for it. They don't, they, they, they wood, wood duck boxes don't bring mallards. Um, what little bit of aquatic vegetation we do got still hanging around there trying to kill it. Um, oak trees. I mean, acorns, you know, that's pretty much all we got. And that's just not going to cut it. And, I mean, that's the way I feel about it. Um, I mean, there's a million topics we could talk about. Release mallards, uh, corn ponds. I mean, I mean, a million, million different reasons you can list the weather. I mean, but it is what it is. At the end of the day, it all boils down to food. Now, as we are into February, uh, toward the end of February, rather, but every February, right after the duck season, social media blows up. Um, different forums here in South Carolina, everybody's talking about how bad the season is, things need to get done, what are the issues, uh, we need to change stuff. And everybody is doing uh, a lot of things and saying a lot of things. Some of it uh, I agree with, it. some of it I don't. Um, I'll let y'all be the judge of it. But uh, I'm going to give you my issues. But before we do that, I'm going to read um, a letter, a posting that was on social media. Uh, at, and it came off of the Carolina Wildlife Syndicate. Um, it is a piece of legislation what's getting ready to happen, uh, hopefully, and uh, I just want to read it to you uh, and so you'll hear it. Legislation vital to the South Carolina duck hunters is being considered. H4177, introduced by Representative Philip Lowe, a Republican from Florence, South Carolina, is about to be discussed in the Senate. The legislation will modernize the South Carolina duck stamp to increase the cost of this permit to $15, bringing it on par with similar permits required by states across the Southeast. This legislation will generate more funding for the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources to manage Category 1 and Category 2 waterfowl areas statewide, which will be mandated to result in improved waterfowl habitat and hunter opportunities. The intent is to better manage that special wetlands which make wintering waterfowl historical, cultural, and ecological treasure that we know it to be. This bill will also establish an outside waterfowl advisory committee appointed to provide accountability over South Carolina National Department of Natural Resources waterfowl program. 
This committee will annually provide an oversight report to the General Assembly. With the help of this legislation, the vital work of waterfowl management will be bolstered to help produce greater results that benefit the public. If the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources does not utilize these new funds wisely, the bill will sunset in five years, returning the permit to its original cost of $5. Contact your state representatives and senators today and urge their support for the H4177 bill. If you don't know your legislators, contact them here at the South Carolina Legislative online dash find your legislators at SouthCarolinaStateHouse.gov. Now I will be putting not only this letter but the link uh, down in the description below so that y'all can read it and then y'all can contact your uh, your representatives. For those that don't know or from out of state who are watching this video, South Carolina <clears throat> is broken into three different uh, hunting opportunities for waterfowl. You have your category one. Now your category one uh, is a lottery or a draw type hunt. Uh, they usually hunt once, maybe twice a week. These areas are generally managed for waterfowl. Uh, some are planted, but the majority of them are moist soil uh, areas. Uh, they, they have levees and dike systems. Uh, these, this water comes off after the duck season to let the natural plants grow and then water gets put back on them um, during, uh, right before the hunting season uh, to help promote uh, waterfowl. Now these areas are generally uh, in an area historically that has a, a lot of ducks uh, and they are uh, pretty much across the state. The majority of them being down on the coast but a lot of them um, throughout the state. Now your category two areas, again, historically uh, are in good waterfowl areas, not the best, but in good waterfowl areas. They are not managed um, at all. There's no planting. Um, there's no moist soil management at all. It's generally, it's, it's an area um, that has some what of, of vegetation there uh, for the ducks, but it, it's uh, it's not managed as tightly as the category ones. Uh, these areas uh, generally you can only hunt them once a week, uh, up to twice, sometimes three uh, times a week, but generally it's one or two days a week, and and that's it. Now in both the category one and the category two areas uh, are closed off uh, except for uh, waterfowl and the waterfowl days that, uh, that you get. Uh, again the category one is a draw hunt so you got to put in for a draw. Category two you can only hunt the days that it's, uh, that it's open and no one else can go in there. There will be no bird watchers, there will be no uh, boats. Uh, if you're doing any scouting, you have to do it from the roadway uh, and from a distance. There's, um, there's no other hunting uh, in these areas. Now you have a third option, which is uh, what I call the, the, the general open public areas. Uh, these areas um, do have waterfowl. They have little to no um, vegetation uh, in those areas. They um, range from the shorelines to out in the open water, up into the Great uh, Santee Swamp. Uh, and I am being kind of specific here uh, about where I'm, what I'm talking about, because I am going to be talking strictly about the Santee Cooper Lakes, which is Lake Mary and Lake Moultrie. So when I say the swamp, that's what I'm talking about, um, just for information purposes. Now, these again, these areas, um, they do have some waterfowl, uh, but there's, like I said, little, little to no food. Now, these areas 
uh, the open public areas are also um, open to the public. So not only we have duck hunters there um, on some of the higher grounds, you could have deer hunters, uh, squirrel hunters, uh, you can have fishermen, uh, you can have boat, just pleasure boaters, uh, you can have kayakers, bird watchers, and that sort of thing. So it's open to the public. Uh, it's not closed off just for waterfowlers. It is, it is uh, completely open and anyone can go in there. And there's no days uh, off. You can hunt those areas um, seven days a week. What I want to uh, start stressing here are, are the issues of uh, what's happening here in South Carolina and, and, and the issues that the, the, the public duck hunter faces. In my opinion, the problem with duck hunting in South Carolina is the lack of food and the amount of pressure on our public waters. So, hey guys, my name is Ben and I'm a friend of Matt's. And uh, when I think about waterfowl hunting in South Carolina, I think about migration and weather and food as three of the big things that affect why we have or don't have ducks. And obviously migration and weather kind of are what they are. In my opinion, there's only so much we can do to affect that. Um, you know, I was thinking about last month, there was one morning I was out and it was 19 degrees. And then a couple of days later, it's, you know, shirt sleeves weather and 70. And so, um, and then rain and lack of water or up and down with the water levels. Um, so I think those are a couple of things. And then food though, I think if ducks don't have anything to eat, they're not going to stop here. They're going to go somewhere else. And so I think food is one that we can do something about. So that's what comes to my mind when I think about ducks or the lack of ducks in our area. The main issue, in my opinion, um, is the lack of food. Uh, there's, like I said, uh, around the lake, there's, uh, the lakes, there's little to, to no food. And what food there is, when I'm talking food, I'm talking about subaquatic vegetation. It's very little, uh, if there's any. And uh, it's, it, 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 it doesn't mean much if you have a big push of birds in. They can eat it out quick and they're gone. They're, they're, they're leaving. So we need to find a way to get more food uh, on the lake, uh, and it's the lake systems. Uh, that includes the swamp area. Now, in years gone by, we had uh, an invasive species known as hydrilla. Now, personally, I like hydrilla, but uh, I do understand the, the problems that, that come about with it. Um, Santee Cooper has um, said on numerous times that it is, uh, it's an invasive species. It clogs up the turbines down at the dams to produce energy, uh, so forth and so forth. Um, years gone by, they used a chemical um, and then they uh, did some studies and then it came out they started putting uh, grass carp, uh, these sterile grass carp into the lakes. And they put them in by the thousands. Uh, and it's going to eat up all your subaquatic vegetation. Everything is gone. Um, and they're continuously putting uh, these fish uh, into the lake system um, to where you just don't have anything, anything for the birds to eat. So how do we how do we combat this? Well, uh, again, this is my opinion, my opinion only. Uh, we need to stop with with the the carp. Um, at least stop for a period of time. Let some grasses grow, uh, some of this subaquatic vegetation grow. Then maybe later on, uh, put some not as many fish in back into the lake. Again, I'm talking about grass carp. I'm not talking about any other species, I'm talk, just talking about grass carp, uh, to help control it. Um, but we got to start somewhere and the only thing I can, that I can come up with is to stop with, with the grass carp um, for a period of time. Now you don't have to, I mean, you know, there are a lot of biologists out there that know more about this than I do, but there's got to be some way to put these these grasses in. The only other way uh, that I can think of 
uh, is to have an annual drawdown uh, during the uh, prime um, growing season uh, for grasses uh, because the water is so high, uh, a lot of water, sunlight can't get down to, uh, to, to help some of these subaquatic vegetation grow up or the natural millets and the smart weeds, everything's underwater. These plants can grow through soil and once they get up they can grow through the water column but they can't do both uh, so otherwise the, you know you, you, your smart weeds and your natural millets are not going to grow through soil and water at the same time it's either one or the other so it's so draw it down get the grasses growing up and then gradually bring the water back up as you do that the grasses and stuff will grow up through the water column um, that is, a, is, a, is an option. Um, up in the upper swamp, uh, there's a real uh, heavy canopy of trees where sunlight can't get, break through even when we do have low water years and to help these grasses grow up. So some thinning has to be done. Somehow, some way, uh, that's a long shot to, to be quite honest. Uh, I don't see them doing that. But um, it's the only way to get, you got to get sunlight onto the ground uh, to let this stuff grow that needs sunlight. Plants need sunlight to grow, so it needs, needs some sunlight, so some thinning uh, needs to happen. Um, uh, like I said, either that, stop the, putting the fish in, the, the carp in, uh, do an annual drawdown during the prime growing season, let whatever grasses can grow. That, or either start planting the shorelines um, of these open areas uh, with a, a rice um, or, a, or a millet of some sort, whether it be Japanese or even natural uh, sprangle top, that kind of stuff, will let that stuff start growing up um, as, as you do the drawdown. Uh, we need the food. Whatever other issues that we have, and we'll discuss some more, is not going to mean a hill of beans until uh, we get food in the lake. And until that happens, uh, everything else, uh, it just doesn't matter. So we, we've got, that's an, our, should be the number one priority, um, is getting foods back, not only in your category ones, not only in your category twos, but also in your, op your open public areas. Um, and until that happens, like I said, nothing else matters. Hey guys, this is um, Hugh with uh, Big Lake Outdoor Products. Hope y'all are doing well. Uh, what you're looking at right now is a wood duck box inside. I just checked it, uh, put some new shavings in there. Uh, got all the wasp nest out, etc. cetera. Um, Matt asked me to provide some commentary on what my opinion is on um, why the duck numbers maybe are not as prevalent as we've seen in the past and why we're not seeing as many ducks while we're hunting. And um, this is an opinion, um, not a professional opinion from like a biologist perspective, et cetera, but it is thoughts from what we're seeing anecdotally and I um, think there's some validity to that to an extent as well. Um, you may ask yourself, why am I showing you a wood duck box? Um, really, I'm using this as an analogy of conservation to the Jack Miner principle. Jack Miner, if you're not familiar with him, he's considered the father of conservation. He started the refuge system. Um, he was the first one to ever basically um, set up a refuge for waterfowl. He did that in what was considered a waterfowl desert. There were no birds in his area. Um, this was long ago when over harvesting was very prevalent. And um, anyway, he set up a place, uh, created some wetlands and um, food sources and ended up um, creating a wetland um, refuge system that um, attracted uh, thousands and thousands of birds. That's where the banding came from. They still have jack miner bands that they put on birds. I believe that's in Ontario, Canada, where the jack miner refuge is, and it's still an incredible success story. But I say that to say where you put resources and safety and food, you can attract waterfowl. And um, same concept with this wood duck box, where I'm putting habitat for them to nest, 
they're going to come here and nest and hopefully come back to this location, imprint to this location, and um, hopefully from our perspective, we'll see them. We'll be able to hunt them to an extent and enjoy them and appreciate them and um, have them for generations to come. But um, anyway, I say that from a perspective of why we are or are not seeing as many birds as in the past. I, I see waterfowl as becoming a more resource of resource intensive um competitive hunting could also be said um people are putting more money into the sport and um that, that can be considered good or bad i'm not trying to be negative in this but there are more places with food and wetlands and flooded timber and places for ducks to be that people are creating and um that's good because um we've seen that not, that in our areas bring brought new species here created new flyways um and it also provides so much food when it's done to such an extent that it makes it difficult for even those people that are putting the resources into play. So you can't say it's just corn ponds or whatever, but I think the biggest thing is there are more resources being put out there, which again, is I see as a good thing, but if you combine that with weather, we do not have as cold a weather as we had when I feel like when we were growing up. There was, seemed like there was always ice on the water. Um, Frozen conditions were always prevalent the later it got in the season. We're not seeing that as much. Um, it's February right now, and um, I could almost be in short sleeves. Um, it's beautiful weather. Um, the wood ducks will be laying here pretty soon. I hear wood um, bluebirds singing in the background. They'll be laying eggs in our bluebird boxes soon. But um, anyway, it should be freezing cold right now, and it's not. And I say that to say that the birds, in my opinion, are not migrating down in mass like they were before um, or as they have in the past. They don't have a reason to, particularly if with all the resources that I truthfully don't believe were needed in the past in the Central and Mississippi Flyway, but now you're seeing people put corn ponds in there, create man-made wetlands and flooded timber. And what that does is those Northern season states, uh, hunting seasons go out before ours do um, those birds aren't pressured they've got places to sit they've got safety they've got food and there's no ice and snow and those birds have no reason to leave that to come further south and um, I, I see that as one of the reasons why we're not seeing as many birds at the southern end of the mi migration flyways is that necessarily a bad thing no um, am I saying that um, corn ponds or other types of resources are bad no i think there's a lot of good that is um, done with that but um that does impact where birds are where they're concentrated and whether or not we see them in the volumes we've seen them in the past but um i also want to make sure that i am specifying that when we have this discussion that it's not necessarily about whether we limit it or limit out or not it's not that type of success. If we're seeing birds, if we're outdoors, if we're having fellowship with our other outdoorsmen, that in my mind is a success because we're getting outdoors, we're, we're enjoying it. Yes, we need to look at the numbers from a conservation perspective and make sure they're managed and protected, but um, we also need to make sure and be careful that our conversation is, is also about the fact that we can always still get out there and enjoy the outdoors, whether we kill one duck or a limit of six, it doesn't matter. It's um, about, again, just enjoying what is so special and seeing God's creation and the artwork that he created for us to get out and to see and witness to. But um, those are my thoughts. Again, unprofessional, but um, anecdotal. And I think there's a degree of some type of validity. And um, I think it's healthy that we also pay attention to it to make sure things are sustainable as well. Um, take care. I uh, hope you all have a good end of your winter and start to your spring. And we'll talk soon. Bye -bye. Now the second thing is water, and I have said this once, I've said it a thousand times. Ducks only need three things. They need food, they need water, and they need rest. That's it. They do not need to migrate any further if they have all three. They just don't need to do it. So when I talk about water, and especially in the, in the south, we got water. Okay, uh, unless it is a complete five year drought where no rain has fallen and all the lakes have dried up, we're going to have water. It's, it's going to be here. When I talk about water, I'm talking about water that's frozen over. Here in the south, especially in South Carolina, places even further south, we just don't get cold weather um, 
and our lakes don't freeze over. So as long as they got open water, they can get to uh, to get a drink and the preen and the splash around. Um, we're never going to have that problem. Uh, I, well, I shouldn't say never because you should never say never. But the you're we're not really going to have a water issue uh, <clears throat> as far as open water. It's always going to be there. So we talk about uh, the you know the the public duck hunting. Uh, we talk about how to get more ducks in the South Carolina. Um, I like to look at it like you look at how to make fire. You need to have fuel. You need to have oxygen, and you need to have that spark. So, same thing for for ducks here in South Carolina. We need to have weather up north. We need to have the habitat here, and we need to have less pressure. Um, just my opinion. I think we need to do either a reduced season. Uh, we don't need to reduce our bag limits, but we need to do some kind of reduced season, reduced pressure. Uh, whether that's um, you know only hunting half a day. Uh, whether that's you know having to hunt out of a boat that's propelled by yourself, um, or you know maybe it's uh, some kind of um, you know season that it's 60 days, but it it's not a continual 60 days. Maybe it starts a little uh, earlier, goes a little later, um, but it, you know it allows ducks to have some rest. Um, Habitat-wise. Obviously, we know South Carolina habitat has been mismanaged on the on the uh, private or the the government owned lands. Uh, hopefully, we can uh, remedy that here soon. Truly, need to get the right people in place that understand how the lakes work, that understand how the plantations need to work, um, and that understand how the Category One and Two waterfowl areas need to work. Um, you know, we spend a lot of money on licenses and things to help the state, you know, pay for salaries, yet we're seeing, uh, you know, the right people aren't being put in, in place. Uh, you know, people with either little little to no experience or, um, you know, they've, they're they not hook and bullet uh, biologists. So, um, be great to see some, uh, some fresh young people step up in those areas. Um, Weather, we can't we can't do anything about the weather, um, but it's just you know we we go through cycles. Uh, right now, I think we're just in a warming cycle, and um, probably another few years we'll go into a cooling cycle, and that duck hunting will get good again. But um, you know, my my only little thing I'd like to end with is is um, you know that I, I believe that um, you know this is a resource here that we have. You know, God's given us the ability to manage this resource, to be uh, stewards for the resource. But let's uh, let's not remember that we need to to be um, you know we need to be worshiping the Creator and not the creation. And uh, so if that means uh, having some self control in some areas of your life, you know we don't need to be. Uh, getting a badge for hunting 60 days in a row. Um, if that means getting out and helping to volunteer in certain areas of the state, putting up wood duck boxes, you know, traveling to uh, the Great Lakes to be able to help put up uh, nesting boxes up there, all that's going to be, um, you know, helpful for the ducks. So just my two cents. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is rest. Now when I talk about rest, I'm talking about pressure. Um, Ducks need a place to go to after they fed, uh, to get away from everything, to do their preening, to do their loafing. Um, they, they need the rest. They don't need to be over pressured. Now, there's a lot of ways to pressure ducks. Um, the most common way is, is, is shooting. Um, when you start shooting in an area, um, a, lot of sh a lot of shooting, ducks are going to get up and they're going to move off. Uh, they're not going to stick around. They're not going to get shot at it every day. So there's a there's an issue. Now this is where we as duck hunters need to uh, have some self control. Now there are several areas on the lake that are heavily pressured. Um, these are the areas that uh, historically. Uh, see a, a lot of birds, a lot of ducks. 
They also have a little bit more food in those areas. Um, they can be in category twos, they can be in category ones, they can be in the open public. But they historically see a lot of a lot of hunters um, in a small, very small area, you know, relatively speaking. Um, I mean, I've seen hunters 75 to 100 yards away from each other, and they're constantly shooting. They're shooting at uh, decoyable birds, they're shooting at uh, past shooting birds that are way too high, aka sky busting. So we need to start looking at uh, self-control, uh, when to shoot birds, when not to shoot birds. And a lot of this is just um, educational uh, things that hunters, especially our younger hunters, need to understand. You can't be shooting at birds that are 75 yards off, you know, 35 yards tops. So there's where a lot of self-control comes in. Um, Another thing, I, you know, I've heard mentioned um, throughout the Facebook um, and in other social media platforms is uh, boat traffic, uh, specifically uh, mud motors. Um, now, I run a mud motor. I'm going to continue to run a mud motor. Uh, I think they're a valuable tool, and I utilize it uh, to get me into areas. And when I get there or get close to the area, I usually put the boat somewhere, pull out the jet sled, throw everything in the jet sled, and I'll walk three, sometimes four or five hundred yards into where I want to hunt. And again, this is educational. You can't be running through the, these areas in a mud boat or any type of boat uh, with a motor on it and running up and down the creeks and the canals and what have you and also blaring music. I, I, I've heard it. I've seen it. The guys will come through the swamp and, and all you hear is music and their motor. Uh, and they're hooping and hollering. Well, this is a form of pressure. And you're going to run off the birds. You're, what's going to happen? You're just going to run them off uh, and they're going to leave. They're going to leave that area. Again, they need a little bit of quiet. So, when you're running your boats um, and you're even your mud motors and your regular outboards, traditional outboards, uh, if you're doing some scouting, scout from a distance. Get close to an area that you want to that you want to look at. Get out of the boat. Walk up to it. Wade out to it. Uh, stop. Let everything quiet down. Listen. You can hear the ducks uh, from a distance. Uh, use your binoculars um, to get into these areas. And then when you go to hunt, know where you stopped at, know where your spot is, park your boat, tie it off, get out, and wade over to it uh, as quietly as you can. Again, this is a form of pressure. And you're going to bump these birds, and you're going to knock them off, and they're, gonna, they're just not going to come back. So like I said, there is a lot, lot of different ways that pressure. One of my ideas, uh, and, and to help reduce pressure, is as it stands right now, um, our waterfowl season starts uh, September 1st with the early goose season. Uh, and, and generally speaking, about mid-September uh, is when we get our early teal season. And then we go into uh, a long period of time till November, uh, the week of Thanksgiving, uh, we have a, our, a week of uh, that week, the duck hunt, then it closes down and then it reopens um, usually about mid-December, around the 13th or so, and then runs straight on through January 31st. Well, that second season, that second split, that December 13th to January 31st, uh, there's where I see the uh, a problem is. As it stands, uh, here on the Atlantic Flyway, we're given 60 days to hunt. This needs to be broken up a little bit. Um, and it will give the, the ducks uh, a, a lot more rest and, and, and get them settled in and into your area and what I suggest and what my opinion is about this 
is look um, at December 21st. Um, it's a very important day. Um, December 21st is uh, the winter solstice, which is our shortest day of the year. Um, ducks, the photo period ducks that migrate, after the 21st, the days start to get longer, which means the, the, the birds are going to start migrating back north. What I'm trying to tell you is if you don't have the ducks by December 21st, the chances are you're not going to see any migrators uh, coming from north from the north unless you get some polar vortex that comes sweeping through the Great Lakes, out of Canada, through the Great Lakes into the Atlantic Flyway and it's just everything freezes up from about the North Carolina, South Carolina line and every pond, every river is just frozen. Well, I don't see that happening um, anytime soon anyway, but uh, that's the only time you're going to see that. So after December 21st, longer days start coming, ducks are going to start coming back from the south. And, and that's why I like hunting a south wind uh, sometime after Christmas uh, or in early, early January. Um, because these ducks are going to be pushing back, you know, they'll be riding that south wind uh, and headed back uh, north. Um, we usually get a, a, you know, a good chance at them. Um, and that's what I'm talking about. Uh, another thing you have to understand is uh, historically the mallard and uh, only migrates as far as the Santee Cooper Lakes. The, the Santee National Refuge is generally speaking it's last stop so if you don't have them by December 21st or that week of Christmas uh, up until the first week of January you're really not going to see a, a huge big push of birds that come into South Carolina so my suggestion is to take that week that last week in January and push it forward uh, into October. Now, I, I know this happens a lot in Arkansas. I've seen it uh, and, and talked to people. Uh, they, they call it the Halloween mallards. Um, that's what it's commonly referred to. And for no apparent reason whatsoever that anybody can think of, they start seeing a push of ducks into the area, into Arkansas, uh, around Halloween. Now, what you have to remember is you start seeing a shortness of days come around the middle of October. So around the 15th or so, um, your days are starting to get shorter, um, considerably shorter, and those photo period ducks are going to start migrating, and they're going to migrate on that. Uh, so they start showing up in, in October. So keeping the early goose season, keeping the early teal season in September, and then coming sometime around the October 15th-ish to the October 31st, just a week in, in there, just seven days uh, in that two-week period, uh, have, a, have an early season here. Uh, um, we're all ducks. Um, you know, you're not just a, a summer duck season, uh, but a... Uh, all duck season. So you, you have the opportunity to shoot some of these uh, early migrating mallards or and, and summer ducks. So uh, have your have your season October uh, just a week, close it down, give some bird time to, to adjust and uh, not be pressured, open it back up into Thanksgiving, uh, that Thanksgiving week which traditionally you know, you have the kids out of school, you're taking your kids hunting, um, whether it's high school or college. Um, it's, everybody likes to get out and hunt during the Thanksgiving week. Uh, and then reopen, or close it down for that, you know, after that, you know, a, a week, close it down. Uh, reopen back in December, uh, around the 13th, and then run it on out, um, uh, again, your your last week or so of January, you're not going to have um, 
because you know you you've used it up in, in October. Now I know a lot of you guys out there, uh, y'all keep saying you know over and over that uh, no, we don't want that. We need to extend it into February. No, um, the reason you're seeing more ducks in February is because at the end of the season, a lot of your private uh, impoundments and areas. And I'm not trying to make this a private versus public thing. Just make sure you understand that right now. But they'll start draining their ponds out um, right after the duck season. And they do this uh, for a number of reasons. But the major one is to get the land dry and get the ground dry so they can start replanting. Because you're going to get your spring rains and whatnot. So you want to you start drying out these holes uh, so they can replant for the upcoming season so they want to get it dry and they want to get it dry quick so uh, now some of these places they do keep water on uh, for the returning uh, waterfowl which is a good thing so they have a place to eat but once these ponds start to dry out uh, the ducks are going to leave it there's no water there um, and the food generally is already eaten up so that's why you start seeing um, a lot more ducks out on the lake is, and that's because they start draining these ponds out. Now to help you with this uh, I just talked to someone the other day and they're hold, still holding around 10,000 ducks on the, the Santee Refuge. Why is that? Well they still have water, they still have a lot of food and there's a lot of rest. They're still holding ducks right now. It's the last week of February right now and they're still holding ducks um, and they're holding a lot more now because of the ponds that are, have been drained out or being drained out so you're gonna see more ducks on the refuge you're gonna see more ducks on the on the public areas because of that now again these are all all my opinions um, um, that I have in, in a way to um, keep more ducks and try to help some of these issues food water rest that's all a duck needs it doesn't matter if he has those he, there's no reason for him to head south duck a duck can take a lot of weather we as duck hunters we need the weather to push the ducks but if it's if it's not frozen over uh, if there's not two or three feet of snow up north, if there's not got a, a ice covering the fields where they can't feed, then that's when we're going to see the ducks. And until then, um, we you know there's just no reason for them to migrate. So food, water, rest—that's all they need. So with that said, and, and these three issues um, that I that I see that, that that needs to be addressed. We need to get the food first. Once we start getting more food on the lakes, then the ducks have a reason to be here. Then we can address the other issues. Um, one last thought on the on the pressure issue is possibly redefining some of the boundary lines that are on the Cat 2 areas. Um, to expand them out a little bit uh, because a lot of the Cat 2 areas um, there's open public in between them uh, which means the fishermen can get in there, boaters can get in there and there's more um, of a uh, I, would, I don't like to say harassing but more more pressure from boaters uh, and especially the fishermen uh, and even duck hunters so there, there, there may need to be a consideration of a cutoff time uh, for the duck hunters. They have to be out of the area by a certain time. Uh, no afternoon hunting in, in certain locations. Uh, morning hunts only. Um, I don't think we need a reduction in days. I think our days are fine at this point. Um, I don't really see a need for a reduction in uh uh, harvest numbers uh, we're allowed six I, I don't see 
where we need a reduction in that as, as far as coming from the federal government. Uh, I do believe that we need to have more self-control uh, on our harvest numbers. I mean, you can only eat so many ducks. I mean, seriously, you can only eat so much. So um, a self-control of, uh, of, of instead of killing six, just kill four or three or five. But whatever it is, um, you know, you don't need to kill um, a, a full limit every time you go out. Um, you just don't need to do it. You, like I said, you, you can only eat so much. So that's how I see it, guys. Um, food, water, rest. Food needs to be addressed, number one, uh, and needs to be addressed quickly. Um, I don't see a, a huge problem in the south as far as water goes. Uh, but pressure is another issue. Um, like I said, some of these redefining of these Cat 2 areas to broaden them out a little bit, uh, to only allow duck hunters into these areas. I know that the fishermen will probably get angry with me. Uh, I understand that. Um, but it's something to think about. Uh, I'm not saying it has to be done. I'm not saying it need, it's just something to think about. Uh, just redefining some of these areas and, and redrawing the lines on uh, some of these uh, Cat 2 areas to incorporate some of that public area. Uh, Got to be out by a certain time um, and no other boating traffic, you know, in there uh, after that cutoff time. Um, again, these are my opinions, my opinions only. Um, hopefully some of y'all will uh, agree with me. If you don't, uh, that's fine too. Leave a comment down below. Uh, just make it civil. Uh, that's all I ask. If it's not civil, then I'll be quite honest with you. I'll kick it off. But um, I would love a, a good discussion on this. Again, as long as it's civil. Well, anyway, guys, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, these are my thoughts on uh, what I think needs to be done. Uh, some people, like I said, will agree and some people won't. But uh, either way, uh, it is what it is and until we start having more self-control and start really working hard as a group as a group of hunters and getting with our legislators and making this stuff into law uh, we're just going to see uh, a down a more downward spiral uh, on the duck situation that we have here so again hope you enjoyed this video and we will see y'all next time on daddy duck 365